Okay, we call this work session to order. Uh, announcements before we begin. Um, Megan McLaughlin will not be here this morning. As many people know, her, uh, her family is involved in the fires in California and uh, Megan needs to go out to help her mom. So that's where Megan is. Um, our first agenda item is the Stuart renaming. Um, I will not uh, ask staff to repeat what was presented uh, as a result of the two community meetings um, that was presented at, uh, at our meeting on Thursday. So um, I know that we have some of our colleagues have questions on cost. And then after we have uh, uh, discussed the cost to the renaming, then we'll open it up um, for any other board comments who would like to share this morning. So um, I think Ms. Evans, if you are ready to ask questions on costs, because I know that you have some. Any other questions on cost? Any other questions on cost from other board members? Yes, Ms. Corbett Sanders. I just want to um, thank Dr. Braybrand and his staff for providing a additional granular detail on the cost, um, I would ask that we actually integrate that data into what had been presented earlier because um, there seems to be at this point so many different data points that it might be helpful to have one, um, one chart that shows not only uh, costs but time frames for replacement of uh, various pieces of equipment, uniforms, um, life uh, cycle of the turf field, things like that. So I guess would this be considered part of a next steps when we're Yeah, finishing? it would be integrating. At this point, I think we have maybe five or six different pieces of cost data. And um, given that uh, as a school board member, I don't have any staff to integrate all of that data into one place, it would be helpful to have somebody okay. do that for all of the board members. Okay, and Dr. Braybrand, is that a, a reasonable ask? Yes, I mean, I think we can try to, we, we pulled some additional information at board request and we can try to break that out based on the year. Part of it will be determining whether um, we would be trying to implement the uh, change for, I think the original resolution said by 1920, whether we would be trying to do it next year or the Based year Based on after. the timeline. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. And before we begin, um, I would like to note that uh, Ms. Ernestine Hasty is with us this morning, and Ernestine was a school board member representing the Providence District. Thank you, Ernestine, for being here. Okay, Ms. Evans, you have questions. Well, I did similarly to um, uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Um, I, I'd like to see, I appreciate Dr. Braybrand, the added information that you gave us on Friday. Um, I think we're, we're still not quite there yet in terms of saying how much each item costs, how much FCPS would typically put in for each of them, how much would be uh, typically the school, from the school funds typically um, boosters typically individuals you know we need to get that breakdown to get a better understanding of um, with the replacement cycle for example for the um, uh, pick up here um, with with uniforms um, we got the replacement cycle um, what we don't have here is who pays for each of these things and how much? I mean, that's going to be important for us to know. Would FCPS typically be paying X percentage of this? Have, do we typically have in our budget three years from now to replace such and such a uniform? Or does this typically come from school funds? Does it typically come from boosters? Does it typically come from individuals? So we, we need to get that breakdown for each of these items I so we get a clearer picture. Mr. Curran, can you help with this a little bit? Good morning. 
Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Great. Uh, the, to your first question, Ms. Evans, uh, who typically would pay for, for this? This all comes from non-allocated sources. So it doesn't, it's not within an FCPS budget item. It's, so it's not paid for by FCPS money, technically speaking. Um, it is paid for through gate receipts, through that you know, are paid as you enter a game, that the public pays as they enter our games. Um, that money goes into a fund that helps pay for this. This comes from booster donations and booster fundraising and what is donated to the school and what the booster pays for it, and then individual team fundraising. The, the percentages per team is varies significantly depending on team, and it varies significantly among schools as far as which of those sources pay what and how much. So uh, for, for our teams and for our band, FCPS and the school doesn't pay a penny for our uniforms? Correct. What about for equipment? After the original startup, so like at South County, when we opened South County, that was entirely paid for by regulation. That's entirely paid for by the school board. No equipment is paid for by FCPS. The, the turf fields are a little different if we're counting that as equipment. That's a different situation. Um, and I'm not including that in that comment, but um, blocking sleds, nets for basketball hoops, backboards, um, you name it, it's paid for out of that, out of what I described, the booster organization, the gate receipts, and the and the team fundraising. Okay. Um, I, I, I agree that we need to get to consolidate the, what we got through the subcommittee reports and what we, we've seen here and what we got on Friday because there, it is um, it, it is different. Um, I, I've gotten different amounts for band uniforms, for example. Um, what is the total cost for band uniforms? The total replacement for band uniforms generally at schools runs about $150,000. For how many students? It can run, it depends, but we're looking normally at about anywhere from 70 to 100 students. Some are bigger, but the average I got, as I asked, was about $150,000. Band uniforms are made to last for 10 to 12 years, so they are not cheap. Uh, Obviously, some of that depends on the flourish and the design and all of those things that you put into it. So that number can vary without question, but based on what is the standard within our schools, what most of our schools are ordering and where most of that is currently among the 25 high schools, it's an average about $150,000. So that's an average. It's um, not, not Stewart specific for that amount. Within the numbers it is, but without getting into an actual order and talking about the the additional flourishes that go into a band uniform it's almost impossible to get down to a very specific number okay and i had been told that the band uniforms at stewart are overdue for replacement is that correct my understanding is they're well overdue for well replacement. overdue okay and the reason that they haven't been replaced is um inability to fundraise for it funding okay thank you I have another question on this, and I guess um, it's from Mr. Plattenberg. On the Turf Field End Zone Center logo, $104,000 is that for the replacement, the entire replacement of the field? Um, one of the questions that has been asked is whether or not um, the logo can be painted out or replaced without having to replace the entire turf field. In other words, wait until the turf field would normally be replaced. Yes, uh, that's a good question. In fact, one that keeps coming up, people keep saying, well, there are different prices about the turf. The reality of it is that um, the, that does include the center logo and the two end logos, two end zones. You could, one could paint. Uh, our experience is not really that great with painting over things. We had some vandalism that was done at a couple of our high schools. Um, and we painted them over and they bled through and then we're constantly painting over. Now, the, the information that I have regarding this turf field is that it's uh, really dark, uh, some of it, so it may require a little more maintenance, but we don't know. But that's the difference in the cost. It, we have an estimated price. Again, these are estimates until we actually know what we're going to do. Um, they're the best estimates that we could provide. For painting over was uh, $3,500, and then, again, um, that included all three components um, for the paint. And for the replacement, uh, the center logo was about 10000 
and each of the end zones were the split difference between the remaining fortune of that over hundred thousand dollar price. Okay, uh, Ms. Darren at Kofax. Sorry. Um, so I'm looking at just cost differentials on a line by line basis here, and as we go through it. Um, I'm assuming some of these things, let, let's just take, I'm just going down the line, let's just take cheerleading. Um, for a complete name change, it, you're saying the cost would be $20,000 and a steward only name change would be $12,700. So for that, uh, am I to assume that maybe some of the cheerleading uniforms, since there's probably multiple, some say Jeb on it and some just say Stuart, is that is is that how you looked at some of these things? or? When it was divided, you know, the idea of, okay, what is just Stuart and what is everything? Mm -hmm. Probably the simplest way to answer the question is with the number if, if, because there was some idea of removing the Jebs. So like the latest football uniforms that were purchased just say Stuart. Just, just say, reflect okay. Stuart. Okay. So it's a difference of 17 and 42. We're replacing 17 uniform, uniform groups, which include multiple uniforms within that levels with the Stuart. We're re we're replacing 42 uniform groups. I see. I see. From yes, the freshman so, through the varsity. So for the public that's watching or listening, so you're saying for 40, for if we were to change the name completely, it would cost just for football alone 47500 But if you left just Stewart and you just change it to Stewart, it would be a $7,200 cost because there have already been new football uniforms um, already purchased with just the Stewart name on it, leaving off Jeb. Correct. When a replacement cycle comes, it's important to note that that replacement cycle doesn't replace all the levels. Right. Everything is legacy down. Yeah. So you get your little brother's uniform or your older brother's uniform. So it. the varsity uniforms are passed down in each one of those cycles. Yes. yes. So that's that's where you also get some of the variances. Some of that, especially in a, in a sport with a high participation rate, you see that those uniforms are passed down. The current freshman uniforms that they're wearing at Stewart. Um, for football, my understanding is those are seven or eight years old at this point, and they've been legacy down. So, and that's just an example that spreads throughout those programs. Okay, thank you, Ms. Keys Kamara. Just to follow up on that, um, I was confused in looking at some of these things in terms of, like you just said, the uniforms have been used for seven years. Typically, when would they be replaced anyway? So can we get information as to when replacement for this school was typically going to happen anyway? I believe it's on the sheet, and I think it was distributed to the, to the board on a... Did I miss it that? ...showed the replacement cycle for Stewart that was specific to Stewart as reported by school staff. Okay, well, I think maybe that points out to it. Ms. Uh, Evans was asking for and that would that all of these be reconciled because I know I've seen uh, a number of documents over different periods of time from facilities as well as the committees and I think um, I'm not sure why why there's differences in what the estimates are I, I'm not sure if that's a question for me to answer I'm just making a statement I, I, and so I guess perhaps some of this will be addressed when we get that reconciled document okay are there any other questions pertaining to cost yes Ms. Corbett Sanders as many people know I am the only person on this board who has ever uh, gone to a school where the name was changed and uh, one of the things that occurred is consistent with the policy which is still in effect today is that when they uh, changed the name of Groveton High School they put the onus on the um, community to raise the funds to address the cost of all of the performing arts, all of the sports equipment. And I will share with you an anecdote that Senator Scott Cervell shares quite often because he was the first class of band members that went to the um, school under the new name. And they were sent off to the local uh, uh, effectively the local Walmart. It was actually a Zares at the time. And they went down the street to Zares and a hundred kids all picked out their uniforms being a same color jacket, same color pants and a white shirt. Uh, the parents each paid for that outfit and those kids wore those uniforms for the four years of being in the band at uh, 
West Potomac. Um, when you look at the list, one of the questions that I have is, you know, that, that is a significant burden for um, for families to have to figure out how to cover this cost. Similarly, I am probably one of the few members of this board who's actually been in charge of raising the funds for um, new band uniforms because my daughter was at West Potomac when uh, it took over. We were Our kids were in uniforms that were over 20 years old. And so we had a major fundraising drive um, where we were close. It had taken us 10 years to raise the money to get to replacing those uniforms when there was an opportunity for the band to do something else. And that was a significant decision on the parents and the booster organization to support the kids being in their band uniforms an extra four years so that we could divert the funds from the band to um, doing something else. So I would encourage that we have a conversation about if we are choosing to do this, where are we going to spend the money? Where are we going to... what? issues are we going to divert? What are we going to postpone? Um, because in that case, it did add additional years for replacement. And so this is a decision that I do think has to um, involve how do we find, you know, if we do this and we choose one scenario over another, and this is part of the decision-making process, what are we going, you know, how are we going to fund it? Dr. Brand. Bill, you, you know, and, and this board knows how I use this word nugget, trying to find different nuggets. One you just shared a minute ago when you were doing the uniforms about legacy, how the uniforms are passed down. And we spent a lot of time last week re running numbers to make sure the board understands, and we're having time right now to do that. So I just want to even my own learning to help the board's learning. While we gave them a year to year of when the uniform needs come up, 17, 18, 18, 19, 19, 20, 21, the nugget is we don't use Fairfax County appropriated budget dollars to do these uniform replacements. We use our gate receipts and we use booster funds, correct? That's correct. It's important to keep in mind on that rotation. Those are the targets. Those are the targets right. dependent on the funding. Uh, the school has reported, the principal and the DSA have reported that at times that target right. is very difficult to meet. So the nugget is we have a recommended cycle, but the ability to do that cycle is dependent on each school's unique financial situation as it relates to both its gate receipts and to the the financial performance of its booster funds. That's why you have some schools where the band uniforms go on and on a lot longer and some that are able to really maintain the cycle. Correct. It's, okay. it's the, the fundraising capacity. The so so in, in the Friday <laughs> briefing I gave you, I just want to share, we took the yearly revenue of the Stewart yearly gate receipts, averaged over five years, plus the booster revenue. That's about 57 grand. Then we looked at average yearly expenses. The, the uniforms were around 27,000 if we kept to a cycle. And then we had other athletic operating costs, transportation, tournament fees, equipment, which was already asked. Um, if we replaced all of the uniforms, the athletic and the band, which is what Ms. Evans was asking about, that would be 491. We took out the current yearly uniform budget. Um, that would be 464,000 in upfront costs we would either need to get through private or through um, existing FCPS funds. So I just wanted to kind of go back. The, the whole purchase of uniforms really goes is outside of Fairfax County Public Schools appropriated budget funds. And so that is a question. If the board wants to go faster, we would need to find a way either privately or through appropriated budget funds put money into making it happen. Otherwise, we're relying on the cycle of the school's yearly gate revenues and booster revenues to move us through the cycle of uniforms. Uh, 12 years, I, I don't know. Um, you, you did the rough number. Okay. Ms. Off the top of my head, I was just running numbers of what is, if you have a 
$29,000 a year current expenditure for uniforms, but you accelerate it based on additional revenue that's brought in from the existing sources, then it's going to cost you about 12 years, uh, a commitment of 12 years or so. Hey, Ms. Evans? So uh, that, that raises something else, as does the band uniforms. It, it would be, I don't believe we've received this. Maybe we haven't. It's just not when we'll get the consolidated, it will, will be clearer. But where Stewart is currently in terms of its replacement cycle, we're hearing that the... Years. Right. Where, where are band they? You know, 12 years football is right. Like, like band is behind, you know, it should have been replaced in X year and, and it's behind. And where are we with, you know, some of these other things are, are, are all of the teams behind or just some of them or some of them current. So I would like to um, get where we are in terms of having replaced them through the current process. The cycle that's provided came from the school. So it was current as of the last academic year. So for this year, I can have that, I can ask them to update it to what their projection is, but they've also been on hold, as you can imagine, because they're not sure what's gonna happen with this. So they haven't purchased new uniforms outside of the, the one that was a critical need. Which well, so are you jersey. saying that, that they are current in the replacement cycle? That the they current have? in their vision of the replacement cycle. So every year it's, you can't count on, take this, this fall, it's been a decent fall. So your gate receipts, your, your number one gate receipt bring, sport is going to be football, but your basketball, your volleyball, your field hockey all do, do well and bring things in. You get a bad fall, you're not going to see $42,000 in gate receipts, which is one of you know, our lower numbers across the county. So you get a rainy fall or a rainy Friday, a series of rainy nights on Friday, you'll have almost nothing in gate receipts potentially. So some, every year when they have that vision, this is what we want to do. But I, I'm not. I'm not sure I'm making my my question clear because I'm saying, for example, the band uniforms yeah. should have been replaced years ago, and mm -hmm. they have not been. Mm -hmm. and so so can, can I add some yeah. sure, to absolutely. that comment? Um, I think Bill is referring to the gate receipts for the athletic uniforms, but to your question was for the band uniforms. Well, it's for all of them. You but know. but yes. for the band uniforms, they are at least 10 years old, so they are probably overdue in replacement, but there's no funding available. So depending on what funds are available through the band boosters, and what we did a couple of years ago was, if you recall, we had a... Um, marching band fee that was supposed to be able to keep up with some of the consumables and some of the replacement. And we had allowed, <clears throat> excuse me, the schools to determine what that fee amount was. Mm -hmm. And because of um, the fee amount, the current fee at band, um, for marching band at Stewart is $175. That's insufficient to do uniform replacement. So unless there is funding available through boosters, there are no funds available currently for mm -hmm. band uniform replacement. And you're saying that's different for athletics? Okay. Yes, because okay. we don't have a fee for sports. For right. marching band, the state allows okay. us to charge a fee for because it's part band. of a okay. curriculum. Okay. Well, and the and the fee a hundred you know a hundred kids and a hundred and fifty thousand. That's if my math's right. That's fifteen hundred dollars per uniform. Is that correct? Based on what the feedback we got from our other band boosters, that's that's entirely possible. There's also other equipment that goes with band as well. Stewart has a trailer. So this isn't ju this isn't just uniforms. It includes some of the equipment, but it would that's a that's what we got from our band boosters when I reached out to them about where we would run. And again, I, I stress that's an estimate. All right. But and I did not go to a vendor on this. Every vendor I called said it will come down. You need to tell us what design you want, I and see. that was not possible. Uh, Ms. Palchek, and then Mr. Moon. Yes, thank you. Um, so I guess I have a, a question trying to make sure I'm understanding clearly um, because I know there are concerns that, right, if this is money going toward uniforms and replacement costs, essentially we have different budgets. Money would not be going to other needs of the Stewart community and the school. But I guess my question is because the school – um, is so far behind on being able to replace some of the uniforms and equipment. And as a 
avid marching band person. I know how much work we did to fundraise. If we were to say this one time cost, whatever the final figures end up being, will be covered by one time payment from the school board. Essentially, is it correct to say that at that point, the boosters and the gates and anything that the school is now able to collect past the replacement fee that would be covered by the school board, essentially they get to start at zero and anything that comes in um, in the upcoming years, whether they are $15,000 in gate receipts or $100,000 in gate receipts, um, it is all now going to either, they have a 10 year period for the recycle, right, to be able to start focusing on replacement, or all of that income can now go to support their programs and their athletics in other ways. Is that, is that correct, that assumption? The, I wanna stress the, the, the staff, and, and I think this answers your question, the staff at Stewart does an amazing job and has for, for a long time of maintaining their programs and, and maintaining their programs with, with a great deal of pride in, in, in those replacement cycles with what they have, and, and they really, really do. So if you envision this like we open a new school, I think I've, in a previous presentation of this board, I, I mentioned the approach of we're opening a new school, and the last one we opened was South County, okay, we're funded at the startup, which is kind of the methodology we used, and then from there, it's on you. Now, the one thing to point out, and I do think this takes planning on the back end, uh, and some, so some real um, crossover and work with their, with their booster organizations and, and their teams, is when you start, and, and this gets into weeds that maybe is way too far into weeds, but when you start with everything brand new, everything runs, it's like buying a new house. Your dishwasher and your washing machine die at the same time. And, and you're going to replace those. So that's overcome, we can overcome that, and the schools can overcome that because it just takes planning and planning out so that you start getting a rotation cycle again so that it works. So not anything that's difficult. And again, you wouldn't be replacing everything right, but, at the same time. Yeah. So to your but point. But just to clarify, yes, we're not shortening the replacement cycle for no. any of their equipment. We would actually be elongating it for all, if not most, of their equipment. So they get to start at zero. Mm -hmm. And if we say it is our responsibility, whether it's purely school board funds or it becomes a match with, you know, fundraising from outside, we are saying, essentially, you're starting over, you're starting with new equipment. And especially in a school where we have heard so much how much they're struggling to have the gate receipts to be able to stay on target with uniform refla replacement. In a way, this is a little bit of a boost to say, we will now cover this. Let's figure out a way for you to fundraise so that you're not scrambling in 10 years to have the funding. But we are saying as a school board, we believe, right, it is our responsibility um, to help with the replacement. And we are now giving you a 10-year boost approximately. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, just the... Um the board does that absolutely. The answer is correct. I, I'm just kind of envisioning in my mind that, that that's an exciting thing, to be honest. If, right. so if I, that's right. what they do, it's, it's a, you know, if we're going to rebrand the school and that's the decision, you know, to me, I, I'm okay. And, you know, I, I believe that brings a great deal because it's all new. Everybody's shiny and new. And it really rolls out. And I think, you know, the student so body. Rather than seeing well. this so much as a burden on the school and the boosters, we can see it as a, we believe this is important. We will give a boost, and now the boosters and, and and the and the athletic programs and the arts programs have a fresh start. So it just I wanted to. I, I don't think we've had that conversation in that way around the budget, and so I, I know this is a school where we are all very invested. It is a high poverty school. It is a school where we know how difficult it has been, challenging compared to some other schools in our community for the boosters and the programs to raise funds, right? So this is a little bit of a boost. And I just want to make that clear um, and, and and make sure that that assumption is correct on my point, because I think that's very important when we have this conversation and the tone of this conversation. Dr. Braybrand? <clears throat> this may help the board, but it's one of those, it's one step at a time, and I'm not trying to get ahead or behind the school board. If you make a decision on you've made a decision to do renaming and you have uh, five names in front of you that I've recommended, then 
we need to decide a timeline. Based on that timeline and the timeline Bill Curran needs to order uniforms, we need to have a decision about at what point as we private fundraise would FCPS decide to appropriate dollars to either subsidize the cost or accelerate the purchases to then be repaid over time through, I mean, those are questions to me that the board will have to decide. It's not for me to decide that. Um, so the, 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 the lag on uniform purchase bill, though, just to help the board with the timeline thing, is, is about what? To be ready for the fall season, say, of next year, right? even though I know the resolution says two years from now, but to be ready next year, when is the latest you would have to start purchasing and pay for those uniforms? We like to look a season and a half. So we really before the spring season started to have orders and, and everything placed and done is important for the fall. And the same would go. So you can back everything up basically a season and a half now, I'll be honest, a season and a half is because you never know what's going to happen. So to me, I would say January 1st, because I'm taking a very conservative approach to I want to make sure we get for, this for, done. For, for next fall, for August right. sports. Now, could we beat that? I'll Honestly, yes, we'll find vendors that will beat it. But January 1st, make sure that is the most a- reasonable. Let's give the board reasonable expectations since mm-hmm. we're all going to be held accountable for that. <laughs> yeah. Just checking. January is a reasonable time by which you would need to make purchases for whatever year in which you would want the uniforms available starting in August when the school year begins. For for the fall sports. So January for the fall sports would be what I would want to have. And then again, the winter sports starting in November, I'd want to see, you know, March, April, and with the spring starting So guidance that I would want as superintendent from this board would be if a decision Um, when the decision is made of whatever name it is, what year you'd like and whether the, the, the issue of private fundraising versus FCPS budget support, because say private fundraising starts November 1st, you all are taking a vote at the end of October. By January 1st, that's two months. We may have X amount. That may be still short of the full amount necessary to what extent would the school board authorize FCPS budget dollars? Do you see what I'm saying? Or would it authorize it, you know, regardless of the, 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 the private fundraising? Th- those are some of the questions I think we'll, we'll want to understand so that we meet whatever board um, expectation is when the final decisions are made. Okay, I'd also, I just, just so that we keep track of um, decisions and discussions, in next steps again for this segment i'm now hearing two things one is is compiling i know what was in the brave brand briefing consolidating all of that and then also uh guidance needed for the superintendent um as to uh, exactly when funds need to be expended um miss palchuk you have uh, a little more to ask and then i'll go to mr Pony. just quick follow-up um and this might be to bill and perhaps miss corbett sanders uh when we did change the name uh of your school do you remember what we did with um the old uniforms are those donated back to students were those fundraised out i'm just wondering this is what happens to the equipment? There have been different models and, and even uh, different school districts have followed different models. Um, one of the, the ones presented that I've seen is that it's sold. You know, do, do alumni want this old Find material? Um, do, do, they want us, do they want this for their legacy and so that they hang on to it? So one of the options is to sell. Um, other options are obviously our warehouse and then our warehouse. There's a process by which we go through disposing of old equipment and materials and things like that, that that we're not using. So there is, you know, I do know the, uh, the, the interestingly enough, the athletic director from Fort Hunt High School is retired about eight years ago from, from the system. He was then at West Potomac and opened West Potomac. And he's been a wealth of knowledge around that transition and how some of that went. Um, the Fort Hunt community was eager and, and did, you know, there, there was a great deal of allegiance on the Fort Hunt side as we still see today to a degree. And, and, uh, so they, they, you know, kept it 
And there was a lot of, he said there was a lot that went back out to the community as they, they dispersed their, their equipment and their gear at the time. And if I can just add to that, um, that is correct. The Fort Hunt community certainly did, um, were able to protect the legacy, but a lot of that was because the, um, they had the financial wherewithal to do it. Uh, you saw less of that on the uh, Groveton side, and which was a bit more diverse in socioeconomically. Um, and so one of the things that, and I can just give you a little bit of background on the most recent time we bought uniforms for uh, West Potomac's band, um, we tried to sell the uniforms. And because of the age of the uniforms, we were unsuccessful. Um, in selling them. So then we had the brilliant idea of trying to donate them to a um, less uh, capable, you know, band, less financially stable band. And we were unsuccessful there too. So we did have an industrious um, parent who cut up the uniforms and made them into pillows. And we were able to sell, I think, 50 of them. Mr. Moon? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for all those questions, you know, Ms. Pelchek. I think um, you're trying to clarify, uh, for many of us, uh, the questions we had, that that I am along similar line with you, Ms. Pelchek, as far as I am concerned. The decisions we need to make should be the funding part and then new name that have to bifurcate it, that we make a decision on the new name. I mean, board has already decided, made a decision to rename, now we're gonna, we need to come up with new name. First, that decision, and how to fund whatever the changes that are need to be made based upon our decision. That's a separate decision. Uh, yeah, from my perspective, I would always welcome outside donations, whether from the community or outside the community, always welcome that. But the decision we make as a school board we take the responsibility for the consequences, meaning whatever the short for, for the amount of money that we need, that we need to come up with, whether we can come up with for, to change, to be able to change everything by the fall of 2018 versus 2019, that's the decisions we're gonna have to make through whether it's going to be, you know, a, a, a media review or third quarter, year end, or for the next year's budget, or following year's budget, those are the decisions need to be need to follow after we first make a decision on the new name. But you know, from my perspective again, whatever the shortfall in the funding, we take the responsibility to fully fund. Thank you. Um, now I would like to open the floor to any other comments on the uh, name change in general. And uh, Ms. Kiskamara had asked to uh, be able to speak first, and then anybody else that would like to share. Well, it didn't have to be first, but I'm happy to be first. Um, as the new kid on the block, I've obviously I had a lot of uh, catching up to do. I have followed this issue. Obviously, I'm the newest person who's gone through a campaign and had an opportunity to discuss this on the campaign trail. Um, and I did uh, run on, you know, constantly telling people that I supported the name change. Since coming on the board, I had an opportunity to talk to uh, more people in the community and more people on our board. And so um, I'm going to ask you for your patience in going through my, what I was able to write up this weekend um, because this is a perspective um, that, I, that is the basis for what I'm going to recommend. Obviously, um, this board voted before I came on for a name change, and now we are at the position to define what that means. In the course of my discussions with a number of people, um, I'm getting different viewpoints as to what has happened, how we got here. Um, and so for that reason, um, I'd like to take this moment to kind of tell you where I arrived in my research and um, what my recommendation would be. Um, I will tell you that um, during my campaign, I felt that fundraising for the whole amount 
uh, was would, should be a priority, and that was with the knowledge of understanding uh, what kind of school we're talking about and some of the financial difficulties um, that they have had. But I have to tell you that I, like I think many of you, um, was struck by what happened in Charlottesville. And that brought some of these issues, um, made it more urgent. Um, and so now I really do think um, that we need to make um, a clean break from the past. Um, and I think that I'm not the only person who was impacted by that particular event. I know that there were comments that were made pre-Charlottesville. Um, and so I just want to kind of point out that I think that may be a turning point for a number of us. So I spent a great deal of time, as I told you, researching. I've uh, spoken to Fairfax residents, many Mason constituents, students. I've read a lot of historical documents, including school board minutes, um, some relevant case law, not the actual cases. I do that in my business, but just the basic, um, what the premise of that case was. I've also looked at Fairfax County uh, policy uh, as it is now and as it was at the time that Stewart, the Stewart name was placed uh, on the school. I strongly believe um, that it would be wrong to make this decision in a vacuum. I think that our students are very aware of our current political atmosphere as well as some of the history. And um, I think that all of that is relevant. Um, I think that our kids are watching, our community is watching, and we can set an example that helps us to not only move forward, but to do so with courage and confidence, respecting all of our citizens. So these, this is the basis of where I have arrived. This is a matter, I firmly believe, this is a matter that began with students um, who had a concern. And they began, they began this whole movement. And it was really kind of ahead of where the country is now. Um, and so I want to respect the fact that they had concerns. I've heard a number of people um, state it was just a few people, um, but those are important. Those are important viewpoints, and I don't want to minimalize those viewpoints. Um, again, I've already mentioned the history and how I want to talk a little bit about how the name came about, because in that history. It was a time period that did not recognize African Americans or people of color as being equals. Um, so I, I, I want to say that indignities, large and small, matter and harm is harm. And I'm looking at this really as part of our race history in our nation. So. Uh, it's clear to me from my review of all of this information that this name came out of a historical time when our state and our school system was rejecting the Brown versus Board of Education decision with respect to desegregation. During that same time period, there was a call to massive resistance, particularly in Virginia, that education was a segregated affair and African Americans had to either go to Prince William or DC for an education. Uh, until all black schools were opened, uh, namely Luther Jackson High School. It took nearly 10 years for Virginia to comply with that desegregation rule. The naming of this school coincides with state efforts to resist desegregation, that such tools as pupil placement were tools to keep African Americans out of white schools. Even when a few African Americans were allowed to enter white schools, the state began paying white parents to send their kids elsewhere through the free Freedom of Choice initiatives. That Stewart wasn't the initial name for the school, but rather Munson Hill. And during the course of the massive resistance, we went to, it was discussed on the school board to consider Stonewall Jackson and then Stewart. That during that time period, state funds were used to pay for discriminatory practices it was, in my opinion, state-funded racism. At least some of our kids know this history and how the name came about, and they are offended by it. And I would also point out that I'm not just talking about kids of color, or even citizens of color. 
they recognized that the placing of that name on the building was an injustice and that we have continued to use taxpayer funds to spo sponsor this offensive practice. I have heard many talk about erasing history and that changing the name would do that. But unfortunately, in referring to the history, they don't really recognize how we got there or how that name got on the building. I disagree that it's time, I disagree, it's time we told the whole story and thus explaining why we need to remove the injustice in a school with such a large percentage of minorities. We need to replace this injustice to our community, I believe, with justice. And that is why I support the name Justice Thurgood Marshall, as I expect the school will be known as Justice High School. This is consistent with the One Fairfax Initiative for Fairfax County, as that calls for intentional acts that bring equity to our communities. This is a name that students can be proud of, as it was Justice Marshall that spearheaded many of the civil rights efforts that led to the segregation. Now, there are even, believe it or not, two central sad points, in my opinion. We uh, don't, we have not really embraced this dispute. We've kind of fought over it, and I know that we've talked about it. Um, but by not recognizing what, how we really got there, I think that is perhaps one of the most harmful things. Um, I do think we need to talk about the Confederacy, but we need to recognize that, what that meant, and that it wasn't an embracing of the United States of America at the time. And our kids should learn about that. And our kids should remember, and we should all remember what happened or what happens when you devalue another human being. But we should also take this as a warning that when we do not clearly break from the mistakes of our past, and I do believe using state funds at that time to place the name, that name, a Confederate soldier on a school using state funds was a mistake, we are bound to have to go that way again and pass the test of declaring what's right. I say that this is particularly important because the George Mason study kind of lets us know that we have some work to do still. I know it talked about hiring practices, but the MSAOC reported after studying that, um, the George Mason study, that with respect to, to subjective forms of discipline, there are disparities. And I think that that's something that we need to work on, and that is where we are today. And I mention this because I think that some people say, well, Karen, that happened a long time ago. But there are remnants of where we have come from, and I think we have an opportunity to clearly break from that past. So these are the remnants of our past that I suggest that we try to overcome. This is not a statement of blame, but it is a challenge to face the reality of where we are and do something about it. I encourage you to replace the injustice of our past with justice. Thank you. Thank you. I believe, Ms. Schultz, you wish to speak? Yeah, and I'm sorry I wasn't here for the very beginning of it, but um, I think we put in about, I don't know, I've lost track, 11 hours of work session time on this um, topic alone. Um, the real question for me um, at this point is, um, what is the tenor of the board? Um, and what was the point of a community vote if we weren't going to listen to the vote? I, I, I just don't understand the context of really how we've arrived here. And Dr. Brabrand, you and I have had a discussion about that, of, um, you know, the concerns I have that the, the actual voting um, was limited to a certain number of you know, pyramid specific homes and one vote per, and what do you do if there are people in a household who don't agree? Um, I mean, not not all households uh, share the same opinion. Um, and the attribution of that um, significantly, uh, the fact that the names were poised by the full community, um, but then limited to the vote within the pyramid and on a date where uh, a tag sale happened. 
and students may not have been um, available. Um, what's their split loyalty? So uh, I have concerns about, you know, are we representing a student vote? Um, uh, what was the point of the vote if we weren't going to follow the vote? Was it just to get some more names on the table? Um, there was a, a tremendous effort um, put behind certain names, and yet those certain names still didn't rise to the top. Um, and so if the board's going to do what it's going to do, I feel like maybe what we're going through are is almost like a, a, a game of charades. You know, if we're going to get to the end um, and the board's going to vote for what it's going to vote, then, then let's stop putting more of our time into a vote that's going to be, you know, predetermined. The only thing is, is that I don't know what where everybody is. Uh, I haven't heard from a, a single board member on where they stand at this point. And we're supposed to be voting. We're supposed to be coming to a, a final vote. Um, you know, I think that you did potentially the best you could um, coming in with, I don't know, was it 60 days? I don't even know if it was 60 days before you had to do, you were into the community doing something. So it wasn't fair of us to do to you. Um, I, it, frankly, it wasn't fair for, for us to do to ourselves. Um, we should have taken a vote a year ago. Um, but, I, you know, I don't know the way forward over the next, you know, so many days. You know, is, are we going to pass a vote on seven? Are we going to, I mean, are we going to rename a, a high school on six and a whole bunch of abstentions? Is there going to be seven or eight with abstentions and no votes? I mean, the, the, the unity that, you know, there's a, a, a theoretical clamor for is not going to be reflected in a final vote from what I can tell. I can predict that right now. Um, so... I'm very conflicted as a board member of where we stand, even in the process, because we're we're still practically, you know, making up the process as we go. We're we're, we're trying to come to some solution um, here where um, the community voted again, and we're still recalculating what that even meant. Everybody's reinterpreting what the vote meant and that the top amount of votes doesn't reflect the top amount of votes. You have to add together all the votes that weren't the top votes in order to get the top vote, which I'm not sure that any election in history has ever worked that way. So um, if you're not going to um, take the top vote, then what do you do? You're going to get to whatever you were going to get to anyway. So... Um, I, you know, I don't know how to reassure the public one way or the other. I don't know how to reassure, reassure our, ourselves. I don't know what's going to happen after we leave today and how the decision is going to be made. But I can tell you the next time we're at a table about this on a work session, from a work session to a regular board meeting, when we walk into that board meeting, the decision will be made. And we'll talk again at the dais and we'll make a vote, but the decision will have already been made. So between today... And the time we vote, everybody's going to talk to each other off book, behind the scenes, and we'll arrive at a decision that is probably potentially already made as we sit at the table right now. So that is the frustrating part of having this work session scheduled, is it's an attempt to, to, to demonstrate that we're actually doing the work together today or that we have a process laid out where we're, by which we're each going to speak to each other and arrive at, at a decision. But I don't think that that's actually going to happen. I don't think that that operationally, um, from a governance structure, by and amongst ourselves, is, is how this is going to come to fruition. Um, and I think that when we see frustration in the public for the work that we do, I think Right now, what we're doing today is exemplary of 
that frustration that exists within the public. So if anybody here would like to comment on how we're actually functionally going to arrive at a decision, unless one's already been arrived at and I don't know, maybe I'm in the dark, um, I would love for that to be a topic of the conversation as opposed to just sort of commentary. How are we going to work together between now and the next board meeting um, to come to a decision? Are we just going to talk to each other and uh, is there just a consensus collecting until you get to seven and then everybody stops talking to each other? That's what I'd like the topic of today to be. Ms. Belchick? Yes, thank you. Uh, I will address a couple of points. Um, I think I will start with process and work, uh, listening to what Ms. Schultz, Ms. Schultz's comments are. Um, number one, I will say, and I was just talking to Dr. Ramey, how difficult it is, uh, and I'm experiencing that now as a teacher, to be building the plane while you fly it. Um, so I think it's important uh, to decouple process versus where we are now and where we are going forward. Number one, I would have loved, I don't think I've received a single phone call from you, Ms. Schultz, asking me where I stand on this. If that is so critical, if that is so critical to you, I would have loved it. I, my plan is to have this discussion today at the work table. We do not have control over sunshine laws. We do not have control over the way we can communicate. We do have control over how we speak to each other, ask each other questions, and when we have an issue with the process, we bring it to the table, we bring it to forum, and we bring it forward. And so I understand your frustration. I completely agree that the process could have been improved and should be improved for the future. We are now several years into this process, and so no, I do not agree in completely halting the process because we were not all able to over the past week, month, year, two years, able to call each other and have that conversation. We can have a difference of opinion on that, but I, I would love that call. I would be happy to talk about where I stand. I am here today to give where I stand and what I believe we need to do moving forward. You know what, elections, yes, you take the top result. You generally have a primary first, or in some countries, you have a round of elimination, and that is what we've done in other school naming processes. That's something once we get through this process and finalize it, I think is really important for us as a board and to show our students and our community that we are here to learn and to improve and to grow, that we need to look at our process. And there are school systems, I know there was at least one in Williamsburg I've brought up before that did this, that created a process that included input from students on names and went through a primary, essentially, before going to a final vote. I would recommend that for the future. Unfortunately, we cannot go back, and we did not do that this time. So I'd be happy to have that conversation moving forward. Um, so that's number one. Number two, uh, speaking to Ms. Um, Keith Gamar's recommendation, uh, I, I have put quite a bit of thought, and I would like to give where I, where I stand right now, um, and I am would love for us to have this conversation today, because we are getting ready for a vote, and I think it's time for us to have that decision. Would I love for it to be a 12 out of 12 vote and consensus that, yes, that would be amazing. Um, do I want us to stop and not do this because we cannot reach consensus? No, I think the public and our staff and community deserve a final decision from us. So um, I think there are several names of the five that were brought forward to us that I would support. Uh, I'm going to be clear right now, I will not support keeping a name of Stewart in any fashion on the school. It is not a renaming. I know we had a vote earlier, and I agreed to the consensus so we could continue the conversation, but I will not support uh, Stewart High School or a combination of Stewart High School that is not um, looking at justice, that is not uh, reconciliation, that is not looking at what we've done in the past, uh, not just with our schools, but a community across the street from where I live today that was ousted, that their land was taken under eminent domain to build a school that was never built, an African-American community, and all that remains is their burial ground. So no, I do not, and that was the same school board that made that vote. So no, I will not support keeping the name of Stewart High School. Um, when it comes to the other names that were brought forward to us, uh, I am amenable to several of them. Uh, currently, where I stand is that um, I was thinking back today, uh, 
Having been an immigrant at six years old and every single day standing up to proudly recite the Pledge of Allegiance and the pledge that ends with liberty and justice for all. We have a Liberty Middle School. I think it is high time that we have a Justice High School. Um, justice Thurgood Marshall, before being a justice, fought for board versus education and lived in the community. So I do, I, I've heard from our community and I, I, I was sad in it first and originally I really was looking for the name um, of our school to finally have a high school named after a woman. I'm very sad we don't have that yet. Um, and I would be supportive of Barbara Rose Johns. Um, where I am now is I, I would support both names, but I do think that for this school, where it is, the fact that we are changing and giving it a new name, I think it's critical that um, we take in several factors. Uh, and the fact that Justice Marshall was from that community, I believe his widow still lives, uh, and Lake Barcroft community. Um, actually, there is a, a documentary that came out, I believe, this week uh, or next week about the work that he has done. Um, I think it's important that as a member of our community, we recognize his work, especially because his work uh, did lead to the reversal um, of the practices at the time that fought against uh, desegregation. Uh, in addition, I, I do want to know from legal counsel, uh, because I have heard the concern, can we legally have two high schools named Marshall High School, even if this one is going to go by the name of justice? Um, so do we, is that, are we okay with having two schools that have the name Marshall in them? Ms. Palachek, we're looking into that and we'll report out to the board uh, well before the uh, board's hearing uh, and final decision later this, later this month. So before the, do you have a sense of how long before the final vote? It will be this week. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think that's critical. Uh, so if, if we are to say, well, we did not have a primary vote, but we do have five names before us that were the top vote getters. Would we love to have more turnout for our elections? Yes, for all of them, I would love to have more turnout. We have to work with what we have. So uh, of the top five names, I think I've been clear, I will not support Stewart High School. Uh, I'm least supportive after that of Peace Valley High. Uh, I think uh, Stewart, Barbara Rose Johns, uh, in the order that they are there, um, and, and Colonel uh, Men Menendez, sorry, Menendez uh, would be my, my next vote. So I, I will vote for any of those three, uh, and my top vote being for Justice Thurgood Marshall High School. Thank you. Ms. Evans? Yes, thank you, and I uh, want to uh, agree with Ms. Palchek that um, in, in times past we have had um, elimination rounds. You know, we had 73 names, and uh, with, with Bailey's Upper, I, I don't um, blame staff for that. I don't think any of us uh, anticipated 73 names and, uh, and where that would lead us. But in, uh, with the naming for Mason Crest, we had several rounds uh, before it came down to two, and we came up with one, and Bailey's Upper, I think we had four rounds. Um, so that, uh, you know, moving forward, if, if we ever are confronted with this again, we'll um, know that, that having some method of um, Having elimination rounds will uh, will be important, and um, I wanted to make sure that my colleagues had received a letter. I don't think most of us have from the MSAOC, uh, Mrs. Uh, the, I got, got this this morning, um, and so just wanted to be sure that my colleagues had heard. This, I'll, I'll pass it on to, to all of you. Uh, they're taking a position also saying that they reject any proposed name that includes the name Stewart in its title. We reiterate our belief that Stewart High School should be named in, renamed in its entirety and continue to support efforts in the community to do so. Um, leaving any vestige of the name Stewart as part of the school's designation is antithetical to the principles of equity and inclusion that FCPS purports to hold as its guiding principles. Um, so we, they have, they uh, continue to go on about how um, Confederate symbols, including school names, are a constant reminder of the legacy of slavery and America's history um, of racial prejudice and oppression, including Fairfax County's less than exemplary response to the U.S. Supreme Court's 1954 decision and mandate in Brown versus Board of Education. 
Um, so they they are, um, you know, this is our minority student achievement oversight committee um, who is telling us that they they uh, cannot support anything that includes Stewart in the in the final name. Um, I do believe that. Uh, Part of what we're doing here today is to have the conversation uh, about where each of us stands on the name so that uh, a motion can be crafted, uh, hopefully as soon as possible. Um, and uh, that uh, will fall to me. I haven't crafted one yet because I need to hear from all board members on where they stand. We've heard from two board members um, today on uh, their advocacy. Um, and I, I would love to hear from other board members on what their specific advocacy is. Um, and we will, we will go from there. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Moon, then Ms. Corbett Sanders, then I will speak. Uh, thank you, and my apologies to everyone for coming late. So if um, uh, some of what I covered has already been addressed, I would appreciate your indulgence to have it just reiterated to me. Um, so I guess the first question I have is, um, what is the total of private funds that have been donated so far? We haven't we haven't uh, gotten any private funds in yet, right, Dr. Locker? We haven't. Uh... That's correct. We have not advertised or started that piece of it yet. So would the I, I thought part of it was to solicit the motion was to solicit private funds for the renaming. So was the idea that we would make a decision and then solicit? That's the, the notion. Okay, uh, because it, it could be that we would solicit more funds if we uh, began a campaign before voting. Perhaps not. I'll, I'll, re I'll respect the will of the board. We do have the end of this month, and then you know we would be able to have the website up and running by November first. I, I guess one the bill had shared January first is sort of a timeline, two months. Yeah, we, we may we, have we may have talked about this as a board, but I guess for me, the use of um, private funds is a significant factor in terms of my own thinking about renaming a school. Um, so that would be <clears throat> useful to have some sense of of where we're headed, what the target is, maybe pledges or something. That I think I think maybe I can clarify. I believe the timeline is that the board will make a decision on, on October 21st as to the name of the school and then the fundraising piece. That will be a second decision. Um, I believe Mr. Moon had, we've had several other people talk about that. So that is the intent of the timeline. I, I would share Chairman Strauss, if the will of the board out of this work session is that I get that and our team gets that up and running even prior to your vote on the 28th so that you can get a sense of private funds coming in we would certainly i'll i will take board direction around that as you all deem necessary right now in my head it would be done after the vote on yes i believe that that is that that would be the the timeline we need to vote to change the name to to actually come up with the name and then begin the fundraising so I guess one comment that I've received from members of the Stewart community um, who are interested in changing the name but believe that the change um, should be paid for with private funds. Uh, so their perspective is while they approve of and appreciate the change effort, they don't believe that it should be a burden placed on the taxpayers generally of Fairfax County. So it would be helpful for me to 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 know sort of where we think that's going to end up in terms of fundraising if we do change the name. Okay, the second um, uh, question again, if this has happened, um, if there is any materials that are presentations to help me compare the different alternative names, that would be very useful. Was there a presentation given on Barbara Rose Johns or, or Luis uh, Mendez? Uh, for us to make, help us make our decision. I think at this point we're only left with presentations of the community from the dais, which obviously for some, uh, you know, for example, for Mr. Mendez, it's just one been one presentation. I think one person spoke. So it would be very helpful to me before the vote to have a presentation or materials to look at to help. To I think I can clarify that just so that we did not request from staff. It was those were community names. And I will 
uh, since we must come to a decision at our next public board meeting, we did not ask for a presentation from staff on the other names. We have received significant information from community members on that. So I think, again, in the timeline, we have received information coming from the community, not necessarily from staff, because this will in the end be our decision. So I don't, we are not planning on another work session to receive from staff information on the names that have come forward. So, um, Madam Chair, then, so each board member will go through their own diligence on these names to determine yes, what our own yes, conclusion sir. will be. Yes, sir. It will be our, our, our decision at that point. Okay. Um, all right. This is more of a general question. Um, and this is really for the superintendent, but I guess it's also for the board. Um, now that we are, we're sort of approaching the end of this process, um, what what is the perspective of my fellow board members or the or the superintendent on where this leads us in terms of other schools being renamed? I think again, rather than putting this on the superintendent, it is up to us. These are the decisions that the board, this is the decision that we will make on October 26th. I am not hearing from any individual board members of any next steps for um, our current uh, um, mode of operation is that if an individual board member from a magisterial district wished to bring forward another name for a change, and I have not heard from anyone else, Mr. Wilson. So I believe that's where we stand right now, uh, that there has been no indication from board members to initiate any other movement forward. So okay. this, is, this is not a staff decision. This would be up to us. Yeah, but I've heard from no one. Right, and so maybe that is a, for else. a future conversation of the board to talk about that's right. what, what do we envision going forward in terms of, because this was a very long process and frankly yes. a very messy process and in fact not very constructive, I would say, in terms of our own discussions of, of how and when names should be right. and there has been There has been no indication from any magisterial district board member to initiate another process. Yeah, that's a separate issue, right, whether an individual you know, magisterial representative tomorrow could get a phone call from an advocacy group as Ms. Evans was contacted about a change. So I think we should at least consider the idea that at a future meeting we should discuss how this process moves forward because we do have so many schools and we have so many schools named after individuals that we may and or places or uh, that, that potentially people could want to change. If, you know, and, and that discussion, we started the discussion of what a compelling need was, but I don't think we ever really came to any resolution of what that meant to determine a compelling need. So I would just put it to the board that that is something that for future business, I think we would be wise to, to have that conversation. Yes, but just to answer your question, there has been no indication from any magisterial district board member to initiate another process. Just to answer that question. Well, our plate is full. Yes, our plate right? is very with, full. With one, so, one change at a time, I think. Well, um, we have another process to start. Um, okay, so okay. I, I still am not quite finished here. So the, um, just, I, I don't know, I, I broached this topic before, uh, but the, the process of, of the, that was used at the meetings, I just want to make sure that, um, that that process, the superintendent feels, mirrors what's in the um, the regulation itself. Yes, I did my level best to follow the regulation as it's been developed. Um, you know, you always take anything and learn. Um, I arrived, as you know, in July. I looked at the reg. I've tried to follow it in the spirit. Um, I realized, even listening today, different folks felt we... Um, implemented it at different levels of uh, excellence but uh, I'm proud of my staff I thought we did as good a job under the circumstances and with the context of Charlottesville that happened I'm very proud frankly of our Fairfax County and Stewart community for how they handled themselves those two Saturdays um, we've been talking a lot about discussing tough topics and I thought they were the model of professionalism um, and inclusion and um, 
All right. And one one question as I was looking at uh, your recommendation is in the regulation it, sa it states that similar names uh, suggested will be reviewed with participants prior to the vote to determine if they can be consolidated into one name. Suggested names may not be consolidated after a vote takes place, but your recommendation includes a consolidated total. And I just am just curious as to what the thought process was there, because I'd like to understand what the breakout is in terms of where you've consolidated groups of names. What is the breakout of those of individuals? Because in fact, are, are, are you meaning like between Stewart and Stewart Raiders, or like with Justice right. Marshall? There was Justice, Justice Marshall, and so, even Peace Valley, Peace Valley, all okay, nations. Okay, I think so. I think Miss Quinn or Mr. Smith has that, Mr. So, Smith. So I can share, Mr. Wilson, that we consolidated those names prior to the vote. Uh, we did not do an individual breakout. Uh, so. Uh, those members of the community did not vote for individual names and then we consolidated afterwards. So it, again, it was a pre-vote consolidation. Okay, that, that, that's helpful because it, it wasn't clear from, uh, from this that that part of the, of the regulation has been followed. And, and I think we're all sensitive as to process that we make sure that we, we, we adhere to the process as closely as possible uh, to make sure. Um, all right, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wilson, uh, Mr. Moon, Ms. Darren Kofex, Ms. Um, Corbett Sanders, myself, and then Ms. Schultz has go back. I was sort of hoping uh, to hear from Mr. Wilson where he stood on the actual new name, but hopefully between now and next next board meeting where we have to take a take a vote that you and I can have a conversation, or you can share with us later today about where you where you are going with a new name. Uh, as a person who supported the board's motion back in July to change the name, and also as a person who also suggested to the maker of the motion that uh, we should have our staff request the Stewart community to consider Stewart High School as the new name, uh, that I was certainly hoping that that the results of the vote in support of a steward to be higher than what I saw. That was where I was hoping that with that suggestion from the majority of the board for the steward committee to consider steward as a new name in spirit of a compromise or so efforts to minimize the cost for changing the name. So I don't believe that I can support Stuart with the other four names. I don't want to have a two marshals. That's where I am. Now that leaves us with the three other names, unless I can, or we can come up with some other names that I can perhaps live with any one of those. But at the present time, uh, that I am leaning toward Colonel Mendez. Board members probably want to know, want to hear, you know, where I am on this one. That's where I am. That's what I had shared with Miss Evans when she gave me a call about a week ago, a little, bit, a little more than a week ago, because as the district board member, I bet that, you know, Miss Evans has been and will continue to work with all board members to see whether there is a consensus in new name, and that's what I had shared so far. And I, at the, at the same time, I had told her, and I'm repeating, that I could be persuaded otherwise by my colleagues or even community members, but that's where I am today at this time. Uh, thank you. I will call on Ms. Darren Kofex, then uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Thank you, Ms. Strauss. Um, I think I began, began every one of these conversations with our board saying, um, that we need to be working on policy changes that build bridges and not ones that create greater chasms. Um, I don't know if that's going to be possible in this process at all, but um, I do appreciate this opportunity for board members who are honestly sharing where they are at this time and knowing that um, we uh, 
can change our minds in conversations and I'm not certain I haven't talked to enough of my colleagues to know if there's a clear um, majority out front um, but I am the person that um, when we as, as you know I had an alternate motion and um, basically I said it was imperative that the board come to difficult decisions and they use outline policies and regulations with transparency and fidelity I want us to do this because so that Mr. Wilson, if somebody does come forward, and I am hearing from people on both sides of the Lee, and I do not think this will end with Stewart, and I think those of us who think that are, are fooling ourselves, I know there's a process that we go through, but I am hearing from both sides of the Lee community right now. So because of that, I feel that future communities, they, they need to know that there's a navigation tool, our regulations, and a roadmap to dictate the change wherever and whenever it is needed. And most importantly, I believe that this change, um, this is, this, this, these ch processes of change have to be processes that we can trust. And one where, as I said many times, passion and ideology do not supersede good governance. That is hard to do. I know that um, because there is passion on all sides and I believe there are um, people on all sides who truly believe that one name is right over the other and they feel passionately about it and unfortunately we are left to figure that out amongst the 12 of us where, where it's best to move the community forward. As somebody who, um, as I said, had the alternate motion. Um, and but then the motion that passed talked about in the spirit of compromise and in the need to recognize um, and the need to minimize cost that the that they consider naming the school simply Stewart um, when the 73 names were proposed a first choice emerged and again it was Stewart um, so um, I at this point am in and I'm here and we have heard from students um, um, on um, that side as well that they felt there was a, an email last night that felt uh, the children that at that school that wanted Stewart didn't feel like their thoughts um, were considered but they are writing to us as well so after passing that motion in the spirit of compromise after hearing from a community that their number one choice was Stewart and after knowing our financial constraints and we could have a savings of nearly three hundred dollars three hundred thousand dollars excuse me if we um, keep um, or rename it to Stewart taking off the Jeb I um, I would consider that at this point um, Again, it's it's difficult to build bridges in this process with how emotional it has been. And um, but one part of good governance that I believe is listening to where the majority of your constituents lie. And uh, for the second time in a row, um, the second survey, at least an official survey, resulted in Stewart coming out on top. Um, I am I. I am concerned as Mr. Moon is about naming a second school, Marshall High School. Um, I have talked to the family of Mr. Mendez and they have a compelling story. I have not heard from anybody about um, Barbara Jones um, and um, the, the name of Peace Valley in some ways resonates with me, the irony of putting peace to this process. Um, because the school sits on Peace Valley. So um, in the spirit of transparency, that's where I am right now. Thank you, uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders, uh, Mr. McElmeen, and then Ms. Viconda. Thank you. Um, I too, as many people know, am a big believer in process. And I'm also a big believer in learning from um, our process. But I also think that as board members, we're here to model for a community and to model for our students on how, um, how we do things. And so uh, in um, July, when we voted to change the name of the school, we talked about a spirit of compromise. 
and um, a spirit of compromise that recognized also the thousands of alumni who have graduated from the building, the community, as well as the future students that go through that school. And so from my perspective, in looking at where the votes were, but also recognizing the need to compromise, um, I believe that we have to have Stewart as part of the name of the new school. Um, I fully believe we should take Jeb off the name of the school. Um, I would like to see us consider combining names on the school, which has been done elsewhere in the country. Um, and so I would be willing to consider some sort of combination. Um, I, too, don't think we need an, we should have a second school named after uh, a second school named Marshall, albeit two different Marshalls. It does cause confusion, and what we are trying to do is create um, synergy and spirit behind a school. The second part is that the compelling story of um, Colonel Mendez, who raised his children in the community, who sent his children to Stewart High School, to Jeb Stewart, who um, continued to have a presence in the community, um, and he was an advocate for public education. His um, experience at the Department of Education his role in, and I'm going to butcher the name, but I believe it's the American Re America Reads program, um, all about literacy. That's what we're all about, folks. We're about public education, people that believe in public education, and we're about communities. And so um, when we talked about the spirit of compromise in July and prior to that, we talked about the contributions that the Stewart family had made to the state of Virginia over um, centuries and also to the country. And so um, I, I don't know what was in the minds of the people who sat on the school board in the late 50s when the decision was made, um, but I understand that the um, name Jeb Stewart has had a negative impact on uh, people of color, and we have to recognize that. And we have to recognize that um, today in our community, there are grave concerns about um, race dynamics. And so I think that in the spirit of compromise, we should look at doing something like this. But I would also urge my colleagues on this board and in public office that the time is now to have a discussion in this community about how we can move forward and um, and create a positive, inclusive climate for all. And so I am looking forward to later on this afternoon talking about the one Fairfax policy for that reason. Uh, Mr. McElveen, then Ms. Fittaconda, then Ms. Schultz for a quick callback, and then I will speak. Thank you, Mrs. Strauss. So, um, you know, I think one of the things that has uh, risen to the top uh, during this um, several year long debate um, is the fact that we do not have uh, enough facilities um, or an appropriate amount of facilities named after minorities and women. Um, so I'm trying to get at that, that issue. Um, I, I don't know whether it's through a uh, follow-on motion or a, um, or a, a standalone resolution um, to say that um, going forward, this board um, would prioritize the recognition of women and minorities in the um, in our, our naming processes. Um, so I do want my colleagues to know that I, I will be bringing something along those lines. Um, other jurisdictions have taken that, um, that route, uh, and I think um, it is high time that Fairfax County should as well. Uh, and I welcome any suggested, suggested language or a venue for doing so. Um, I will say that on the the name of the um, facility the facility we are discussing today. Um, the name I proposed in, um, in July um, of, of Gilbert Stewart got a grand total of six votes. Um, so I am I'm sad to say we will not be going forward uh, with that name. Um, but I have not um, come to a decision on 
um, on what I um, uh, my preference is for um, rena renaming the high school. I think the um, the two that um, most interested me were um, uh, Justice Marshall and Peace Valley. Um, but going forward, I could certainly be persuaded otherwise. Uh, Ms. Fittaconda? Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I'm still going to be talking with students before our vote, but at this time, I don't think, like, I'm not voting, but I don't think uh, all of you should support Stewart as the, the new name. I know a lot of people have brought up how Thomas Jefferson could be the next one to be advocated for a name change, but changing it to Jefferson Science and Technology would not be much of a difference. And in the same case, Stewart would not be much of a difference from Jeb Stewart. And I believe that given the context that this name was put in during the massive resistance period, I'm, I really like all th the three names we've been discussing, uh, Justice Marshall, Barbara Rose Johns, and Colonel Mendez, but I am a little partial to Barbara Rose Johns just because of the unique message that could send to the students at Jeb Stewart and also the students across Fairfax County. She was an advocate at when she was in high school. She was a girl, person of color. It would really add a unique perspective in teaching our students how they can be activists, which is kind of what we support in Portrait of a Graduate. We want students to find the problems in their community and work to solve them. So I will be talking to more students, but as of now, I currently recommend Barbara Rose Johns as a new name. Thank you. A quick go back for Ms. Schultz and then uh, Ms. Keyes Kamara. I never said quick. Um, <laughs> I'm not committing to that. I did. So first of all, I want to address the issue of a primary or round um, uh, approach um, and acknowledge um, that that what you did, Dr. Braybrand, is the equivalent of a primary. Um, when you bullet vote, and certain political parties use that system uh, themselves, um, you you establish by default, um, uh, you know, what's your first choice, what's your second choice, what's your third choice. And by attributing um, points across it, you you came down to um, you know the opportunity. But before that, um, the problem that I have um, is the people that say they agreed to continue the process and supported the motion in the first place um, with the name Stewart in it. You voted for it. You vote. You voted for the motion, and. There was not a single substitute motion, not a single set of alternate language. There was no um, opportunity uh, presented by anyone on this board to amend the language to remove the name Stewart from the motion as passed. And as one of the few people who voted against the motion, you know that was part of my problem with the motion, is it was unclear as to where we were even going to head when at the last minute we sort of mushed together the concept that you would keep the name Stewart with the very motion that was being passed, which was to undo the name Stewart. So uh, it, it, the fact that all voices had the opportunity to amend that motion and say, no, we're not going to pass this motion with the keep Stewart language uh, in it, where were the voices then? I mean, to say you, you it was almost as if that was a clandestine way to move this forward but but not attribute your opposition to it at the time. Let's go ahead and get it passed, and then we'll work it out later. So I, that that's I have a fundamental problem with that. I also have a, a problem, and this is maybe a Mr. Foster question, um, of the the notion of gladly pay Tuesday for a hamburger today. That if we if we vote to pay for, uh, to, to change the name, and we don't have the money. You know, we're, we are required by law to have a balanced budget. Um, otherwise, the, you know, the, the, the govies come after us and put us in jail. You, you can't vote to change something that's going to cost um, money and whatever amount of money that is, 700000 800000 a million, 300000 it doesn't matter, if you don't attribute the funds. You mu we must have money associated with something that has money associated with it. And the hope that the community, because we could come up with Peace Valley and all the Marshall advocates say, yep, we're not giving you money for Peace Valley. So 
you, you, I, I don't understand legally how we adopt a name change unless we go to Ms. Quinn and Ms. Michael and say, where are you going to pull the money? And if we get money back in the coffers, we backfill. But it isn't that you create a hole and hope that the hole gets filled. I mean, I, I don't know if there's a staff response to that, because that's actually a, a, a question of how, how, I mean, are we not obligating funds by, by the vote change? And if we are obligating funds, where are we going to obligate those funds from? You are correct. We have to have a balanced budget. We will have to pay for this somewhere. See, so okay. so the notion that this is going to be paid for by the public by by donations is uh, frankly it's a fairy tale. If the money comes, it comes, and that's great. But it's a wish. We are paying for this. So let me just be perfectly clear: we're paying for it. We're signing on the dotted line that we're paying somewhere hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, the CIP because of the CIP. Um, and I brought up long before this, I, I have concerns about naming conventions in our multiple documents. Sometimes we refer to Rachel Carson uh, Middle School as Rachel Carson, and so alphabetically it appears in our documents as R. Sometimes it's Carson. Um, uh, Co Colin Powell Elementary. Sometimes it's under C, sometimes it's under P. I, we have more problems, I think, created by existing naming conventions to add another high school by the name of uh, Marshall, I think just blows the whole thing out of water. Um, and so um, I'm with colleagues who say, I, we, I, you know, unfortunately, I just don't think that that's a, a reasonable option. Um, and schools asking, which Marshall did you go to? Um, I, I don't I don't see that. Um, I, uh, honestly, Ms. Strauss, I, I appreciate the fact that you say we are not going to have staff presentations on these names. I don't remember taking a vote on that. I understand that's your position, but you're one person of the board. And, and I think Mr. Wilson was accurate in saying, you know what, the vetting of people's names, if you're going to attribute somebody's name to a building, um, you have to vet their whole life, not just one aspect of their life, their personal life. Well, we see what's going on in Hollywood right now. Um, I don't know if there's a, a Harvey Weinstein School for the Arts somewhere, but you know, if there is, that's a problem. It's a, it's a question of vetting someone's entire life and how they conducted themselves. Um, and I, I actually have spent quite, maybe more than anybody, I, I've spent hours um, speaking with the Men Menendez family. And I think it's a very compelling story. I think. Um, I, I very much enjoyed the conversation and reading the materials, um, and that is a very interesting, compelling um, story. I find it ultimately ironic, if this board supports it, that I've spent six years trying to get us to acknowledge Veterans Day. It's the only federal holiday that we don't acknowledge, and to name another school after a veteran would be, <laughs> I think, would be the, the penultimate irony. But I do think that the vetting of, of all of the person's lives associated, whether it's Justice Marshall, I mean, Barbara Rose Johns, I mean, what, ha what did she do after she was in high school? I mean, what, what is the complete life story to attribute a building to her name of something that she did once in high school? I haven't heard anything about what happened for the rest of her life. And um, so if we're going to be honoring um, somebody with the name on a building, I, I think you have to be um, what's proved out over the last couple of years. You've got to be really, really careful if you're going to put a person's name on the building um, because it's not going to stay for five or ten years. It's probably going to stay for 25, 50 years or longer. Um, and what does that say? And a, a, stu a steward, you know, um, uh, frankly, Ms. Strauss, you're the one who said, well, McLean's a clan name and Stewart's a clan name, and it's sort of generic. Um, that, that's uh, perfectly fine with me. Um, if it's not, I will tell you. The other name that interested me that's on this list, and Mr. McElveen, you said yours only got whatever. Um, let's predate everybody's history, and let's go with Manahoac. I mean, the, the opportunity to create um, uh, living history uh, and connect students to history that predates 
all of these issues um, is very real there. And frankly, you could just take the uh, um, silhouette of the raider, put um, an Indian feather and a spear, and you could just turn that into an Indian rider on horseback, and, and off you go. And um, not that a nobody wins, but um, it, 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 it takes it out of the realm of a us versus them. And when I was there that Saturday listening, that was frankly one of the most compelling. Um, it ties a lot to uh, Virginia history and our curriculum. Um, it talks about uh, uh, the potential to um, expand and add um, versus subtract and divide. And so um, of, of anything that's not on the list that we haven't talked about that's of potential interest to me, um, and phones work both ways, I would be interested in talking about that. Okay, thank you. I have um, Karen keys Gamar, Ms. Palchuk for a go back, and then I will speak, and then we need to go on. I'll try to just address some of the concerns that were raised, and I'll start with the most recent with respect to vetting. Um, if there's anybody of the names that's been truly vetted, I would say that a Supreme Court justice has. Uh, if there's any dirt in his life, uh, trust me, for the time that he was placed on that court, if they could have found some dirt on him, it would have been pol public policy gold. So um, I understand the, name, the concern about um, confusion, but I think that this board, the school board, is charged with naming the schools, and we can certainly direct the school to be known as Justice High School. Um, I also hear the comments about possibly naming the school after an Indian, and I would say that that would be appropriate if that name, Stewart, was placed on there to um, directly impact Indian Americans, but it wasn't. It was placed on there to speak clearly to African Americans at that time. And I would say that because of that, it causes, it begs the question that we answer it. We have a unique opportunity to really look at something that we have had in our society for quite some time, and that is institutionalized racism. And we have an opportunity to send a clear message that we are doing something different and we are answering the question that is posed by the situation. And I happen to think that that's really important. Um, the other thing that I, th I think has to be a part of this, and uh, it's unfortunate that I'm the only African-American sitting at this table, but there is a weight to racism that um, has to be a part of the process. And it's not a one-time wait. It's not, I lost a name on the school, you know, one time. But it's every single day you can be faced a person of color, and it's not just African Americans, but a person of color can be faced with the indignity, indignity of having being called into question simply because of how they look. And so because of that, because I've raised three boys and I've had to go through some of these situations and I've had to talk to them. For example, when my son came home after going to school with his friends who didn't look like him, not to school, but to a store, and he was the only one that was asked to empty his pockets. And we had to sit at the dinner table as we have had to do many, many times. And many of the parents in this school experience this every day. And so I implore this board to answer the question that is posed to us because of historical context. I would ask the board to clearly, and I, I, it's next in my notes, clearly direct the school to be known as justice. Um, there was also some comments about the school, the people having said that Stuart was okay. I really believe that this is a fluid situation. We are all being bombarded with things every day that place uh, different um, importance. Uh, as I mentioned, Char you know, at one time it was Charlottesville one. Well, they marched again, and they, and they promised to come back. And I, 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 you know, I wonder, have we really counted the weight 
that that places on our students, that that places on our citizens when we have to process what all this means. Somebody said we have to consider the cost. We don't, we have to figure out how to pay for it and certainly we do. But I think there's one cost we haven't really counted and that is the cost of institutionalized racism. And while I think to some extent that we have said it's okay to have Confederates names on schools, which is a state-funded effort, I think that it symbolizes a mixing where we have a certain acceptance, where we allow just a little bit of this offense to be a part of our fabric. And so I would say, uh, while we are considering the costs, that we consider all of them. Thank you. Ms. Palchuk? Yes, thank you. Uh, I have just three very brief um, responses or clarifying comments. Uh, the first one would be, I completely agree that we need the ability to vet uh, any names brought forward. Uh, and so in addition to some of the other uh, comments I made about um, the Williamsburg City Schools and how they did a uh, name retirement, they did pass um, either policy or regulation that said that uh, a name would be after someone who had been deceased for at least 10 years. So I would A, support uh, Mr. McElveen's motion. I was planning on doing so myself, so happy to help um, to, to encourage that we do look for names uh, of members of our community that are female, minority, or underrepresented in our school names, but in addition um, that they they be uh, of people who have been diseased for at least 10 years so that we do have the time um, to, to look at their full life. I agree with that. Um, that being said, the three names that were brought forward in the top five, uh, I, I believe from my brief uh, um, research that both Justice Marshall and Barbara Rose Johns passed away in 1991 and Colonel Mendez in 2001. So all three of those would fit uh, and that has been at least 10 years since they were deceased. Uh, number two, to clarify uh, with the ranking system, I did believe, and, it, and this is my fault and my quick review of the um, the process we had set forth with the ranking system, that it was similar to party primaries for endorsement as, as the Democratic Party did for Ms. Keys Gamara, uh, and in hindsight realized that it was quite different, even though we were ranking, uh, there was not the process of elimination of the bottom names in order to get larger consensus on the top names, which is what the ranking uh, rank order voting is intended to do. So unfortunately, I, I believed when I looked at it that we were doing that and realized in hindsight that we were not in fact doing that. Uh, and finally, um, just quick response to um, Ms. Schultz, yes, I do know that phones work both ways, but I did not come up and make incendiary comments about the lack of communication in my colleagues. So I do believe that we need to call each other more. We are all very busy, um, but I do hope that we will take responsibility before making such public comments on what actions we have or have not taken ourselves. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Moon, that's the last go back. Yes, and just a quick see. comment on, I, I know that you know we're not discussing this you know, potentially upcoming policy, new policy on the remaining for, you know, only after someone who will have died, have been deceased for more than 10 years, about as of someone who supported in the past, you know, Lane Elementary School named after someone who was still living at the time, and also Colin Power Elementary School. I'm not sure that I can go that far, but I'll give some thought. Okay, thank you. Um, I will share my thoughts. Um, um, uh, those names that I would support would be uh, Justice High School. I think certainly um, Justice Thurgood Marshall has been thoroughly vetted and a very honorable man, someone that uh, um, our students could look up to, and naming it Justice High School would get beyond the Marshall issue. Um, uh, Barbara Johns is a very interesting um, uh, young woman um, at this time going forward I would not support that for this school um, I do not support having Stewart in the name at all I several years ago I was amenable to that but I am no longer um, Mr. Mendez has a very compelling story um, I continue to listen more to my colleagues um, so that is where I stand and just to complete the record 
the one elementary school that we opened in the Trainsville district was no, was named for Ludie Lewis Coates, a distinguished educator, um, happened to be minority and was an, also administrator at Luther Jackson. So we have succeeded in at least one new school being named for a distinguished female educator who happened to be a minority. So um, with that, uh, I think well, let's just take a Ms. quick Ms. look. Jessica, I'm just going to make a point of clarification. L Luther Jackson was a high school. So, oh, yes, I know so, that. So let's, yes. not, let's, not, let's not continue the no, myth no, 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 no. that we don't have somebody no. yes. that we didn't name a high school I'm after aware a minority. Of that. It opened as a segregated school. Let's take a look at next steps. Oh, Mr. Moon. I thought you were going to make an announcement for a joint. No, one. I am not yet. Um, uh, the next steps, I believe we have two items. Reconcile the different documents containing cost data. Everyone is in agreement to that. And guidance for superintendent regarding when funds needed to be expended. However, you did share that with us, and you said that uh, if, according to the um, board's decision and that if we were to have uniforms ready for a year from this fall, that there would have to beginning to have some funds expanded um, an intention this January. Is that correct? Okay. Right. Yes, for the fall of 18, if that's how it comes so, out. So just to capture a little bit, and again, I'm learning as, right. as I'm listening. Let's say if we need to make the decision by January, we could bring you what the private funds are, and I would like authorization from the school board to be able to spend, right. if you were to ask me to, to make it happen by this coming fall, the amount necessary between the costs associated with okay. the replacement and the private funds already okay. raised. So I think we have kind of, kind of have the answer to that, but again, just so that that is, is documented. So with that, uh, this work session is ended. We will begin again at 1.15. Oh, Il Young, you had some. Just because I was going to, I'm, I'm the meeting manager for the, yes. the work. Just want you to know the time frame. Yes, I believe 115. That gives us 20. So is it, is it fair for the project momentum session not to start until probably about 315? Yes, I think that, that would be appropriate. Is that okay? All right, so project sorry, momentum. 215. 215, I'm sorry. 215. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, I'm sorry. There's a, a next step missing. Yes, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Legal guidance will be offered by this at the end of this week. Oh yes, Sorry. about if we ended up having two high schools named Marshall, they're having Marshall in the name. Okay. So present momentum will not gonna start until two fifteen. Is that correct? So the step doesn't have to come here at one yes. thirty. Okay. So you're saying two fifteen is a present momentum. Momentum and then um, all it will start at one fifteen. Right, and then that also pushes one Fairfax back. Right. Okay. appropriately okay. okay all right thank you. thank you so we'll break for lunch thank you very much